it's good to see you. Good to see you we miss those that aren't well. And we're glad those of you that are here that aren't well came. As we consider faith, we understand something basic to faith. And that is <clears throat> grace. Grace is essential because without grace, we couldn't be saved. I want you to just think with me for a moment about this wonderful truth. Without grace, Jesus Christ would not have come. Without grace, you couldn't have the Holy Spirit. Because grace of God is what enabled Him to come to us so unworthy, undeserving, hard-hearted, hard-headed, wicked, evil in every way. And God said, in spite of who you are, I know who I am. And I'm going to do exceedingly abundantly above what you are. And I'm going to prove my faithfulness, my loyalty, that you can depend on me, that I'll be your God. Think with me about grace, God's grace. God's grace is so great that nothing can stop his intention. He says in Ephesians 1, is to the praise of the glory of his grace, wherein he made us accepted. That is, you are highly honored, highly favored by God. Why? Well, he chose to do that. None of us could have earned it by any degree of our effort. That's right. So when we look at the book of John, when he introduces to us Jesus Christ, in verse 14, he tells us very clearly, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. You'll notice this, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. The only person that has truth is Jesus Christ. And He and the Father and the Holy Spirit in agreement and in unity live that truth. But He brought it to us. He brought grace to us. He was full of grace. Now, if He was full of grace, guess who else was full of grace? God was full of grace. And you'll find in the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, verse 29, that how much sore punishment suppose ye they be worthy that count the blood of Jesus Christ as an unholy thing and trod it underfoot by which we are sanctified and insult due to the word is despite. Literally, it's the word insult, the spirit of grace. Now notice it doesn't say the grace of the Spirit. Did you get that? It doesn't say the grace of the Spirit. It says the Spirit of grace. Without grace, the Holy Spirit wouldn't be here. Right. That's true. Everything that comes to us by God that's good is from grace. Grace should be proclaimed everywhere all the time. It says the law came by Moses. But grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Now, understand something about the law. The law was always a picture of us working to please God. We were seeking God's approval by doing the right thing. I don't know, have, have any of you ever tried that? Oh, yeah. Did any of you ever get dis disappointed in yourself when trying it? And the more you tried, the harder you tried, it seemed the worse you got until finally you said, this is, I, I was happier as a sinner. That's the truth. Because you see, God never intended for somebody to live their extremes and please Him. 
The law was proving to us that's how, how it works and you can't do that. So Jesus comes, who was full of grace. He says to all people, come to me all you that labor and are heavy laden. You are so exhausted. You need rest for your souls. I am meek and I am lowly. Come to me. What is he saying? I'll do for you what you can't do for yourself. Amen. That is the wonder of grace. Oh, my Father, thank you for giving us grace. I'm telling you, grace encompasses everything that's good about God. Amen. Now, there are those who are going to still try to live this life by their effort, by pointing out somebody else's mistakes while looking at themselves and say, see how good I am, and yet inwardly knowing none of us, none of us qualify. So, he says, and of his fullness have we all received and grace for grace. Of his fullness. Can you think of that? We have received the fullness of grace. But notice the word for, grace for grace. I'm going to just have you look at this word. It's anti. This preposition is first equivalence and then of exchange. It's total replacement. So let's see how this works. God the Father has grace. We read about God's grace, don't we? We know God has grace. Yes. So now we have Jesus who's full of grace. Amen. So they are equivalent because they both have grace. Then it comes to us to get the fullness of grace. And so he says, it's grace for grace. And you notice what happens? There's a total replacement in our life. From us trying to serve law, us trying to please ourselves, us trying to accomplish anything for God. He then replaces all that we can't do with His grace. So it's God, His Son, and now us. We also have access to the fullness of grace. Yes, How wonderful God is. Amen. The question is, are we living by grace? My Lord, how wonderful that is. And we'll, we'll observe something here just in a moment of what Paul writes about. This denotes fullness and completeness. Even as God is love, we have access to His love filling us. Mm. I'm going to ask you a question. Do you really, truly, deeply agree that you're loved? Hmm? Does that love live in you? Yes. Then if that love lives in you, you give that love to others. Right. Amen? Amen? There isn't any question about that. So then, let's go to the next, where we see this equivalent, where the Father's full, we now are full, Jesus made it possible because He brought the grace to us. Now look at this. And with great power gave the apostles witness. Of what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ because great grace was upon them. So two great things happened. They had great power because they had great grace. Power always comes from grace. It's from grace we receive the Holy Spirit. It's from grace we receive forgiveness of sins. It's by grace you are saved through what? Amen. Through Is it of yourself? No. Any part of yourself? No, it's a gift of God. Well, what's the gift? The gift is grace. God gave it to us in abundance. Every good thing comes from grace. Amen. That is, God just said, I open up heaven. That in the ages to come you might know what is exceeding riches of His grace in His kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. So, knowing that be true, I, I, I would, I want you to observe that the following verse says, neither was there any 
of them that lack. I'm going to let you read chapter 4 and chapter 5 and see what that means. Because be this grace was so great and so overwhelming and so abundant, not one person lacked anything. Not one person in the church. Now, let me tell you how great that grace was. That love and that grace so filled the early church that those that had houses sold them. And if they had property, they sold it. And they brought all the assets to the apostles and said, you distribute it as you see fit. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Now I want to tell you, if you saw something like that today, you'd have to say, wow, that is a, that is a real testimony to the resurrection of Jesus, isn't it? But it all fell apart. Ananias and Sapphira, they lied to the Holy Spirit. It's not long before that kind of great grace was lacking because even now the widows are complaining in chapter 6 of the book of Acts that is the, the Hebrew Grecian women were not being served as were the Hebrew widows. So now there's conflict. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? What starts out so great with God? Something happens. Matter of fact, God really judged Ananias and Sapphira harshly for that. Well, let me have you move on to this divine influence in the heart. Because that's what grace does. It gets in your heart. The word influence is also a word of power. A word of authority. Let me give you an example. Do you think a military leader has authority? Does he influence a decision made by his company or brigade? Yes. yes. And you follow his command because you must, or you can be court-martialed. So it's done out of fear. Or maybe out of pure loyalty to the country and to those that serve with you. But there's another influence, and that's an influence of your spouse. Now, that doesn't mean it's done through authority or it's done by dominion or command. But I will say this, I believe the influence and the power of a spouse is more powerful than a general. Say, why is that? Because it's born out of love. And the sacrifice there is you would truly lay down your life for your wife. Amen? Amen. Do we see the difference? And this is what Jesus did. This is what grace does. It was such a divine influence and power that it, grace is irresistible to those who have received it. We understand how mighty it is. And I'll have you observe that in just a moment. And I want you to see here in the book of Romans, chapter 5, where Paul is writing... And he said that this marvelous grace is, is not as it was by one that sinned, so is the free gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation. You got that? But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. And just think about that for a moment. One sin brought condemnation and death. <clears throat> but he said, I don't care how many offenses there are. It doesn't matter how great, how extensive, how extraordinary are the offenses. I am telling you the free gift is to many offenses under justification. What he's trying to show you is the expansive difference between the grace of God and the judgment on sin. How great is His grace. How great is our God. He would just say, bring them on. I've met people who said, I've sinned too much. I know God couldn't save me. I said, man, if the Holy Spirit ever comes on you and you sense His love, you'll run to Him. You'll bow to Him. Because you'll be so thrilled with this influence in your life. Matter of fact, grace is also the influence of thanks. 
In 1 Corinthians, Paul writes about five times, thanks. That word thanks is grace because it's the reflection in our life of the influence that has come to us. And so we respond, this is called the Eucharist. This is the table of thanksgiving. Yeah. If you remember Jesus, He even gave thanks, didn't He? Amen. He gave thanks that His body could be given and His blood could be shared and we would inherit the riches of His grace. Amen. Oh, grace, how great and marvelous you are. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Grace. 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 Now, for if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the free gift of righteousness. Now just pause and think about that for a moment. First, one man's offense, death reigned. Oh my Lord. But much more they which receive an abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness. Are you ready for this? Shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Amen. What God intends for you and I to do in this life is to reign. Amen. It's to rule. Amen. It's to be righteous. It's to have His grace. It's by this gift that we don't take a back seat to anything. If you'll ever notice Jesus, did you notice Him? Was there ever a time that He wasn't in control? <clears throat> hmm? no. Did you ever see a time He didn't know how to answer? No. Was there ever a time He said, oh, wait a minute, let's negotiate that. No. Never. He always reigned in every circumstance. When they would try to trick him with questions. He reigned. And they would walk away baffled. He always had the right answer. And he says to us, let your speech be always with grace. Give a reason for the hope that's within you. God expects us to draw on grace because from the grace of God comes the Holy Spirit of God. Amazing, isn't it? Listen, it was from the grace of God that Jesus Christ came down here. Amen. He wouldn't have come if it hadn't have been for God's grace. The Apostle Paul writes about God's grace more than anyone. He loves the grace of God because he understands. Let me just... I need to consider this with me. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, By the grace of God, I am what I am. See that? What made him what he was? The grace of God. And his grace toward me did not prove vain. But now notice how much energy was in grace. I labored more abundantly than them all. Yet not I, but who? The grace of God that was in me. You see, it's this grace that God gave him that put him in the ministry. Notice another thing about Paul. He went to God because he was being buffeted by Satan. And the scripture makes it very clear in this buffeting, he speaks to God. Because he's tired of being beaten and abused. Everywhere he goes, he's going through this horrible torment with that. And the Lord said, My grace is sufficient for thee. Really? My grace is sufficient for thee? Now, what's God saying? Out of your weakness, you'll be made strong. Now listen to what Paul says. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then I am strong. He says, bring it on. 
In other words, I welcome it now because I see God's grace is greater and I'm going to reign by that grace no matter what you do to me. How you torment me, how you perplex me, I now see God's grace. God said, I'm going to show him what great things he must suffer for my name. Do you ever notice this about Paul? He rejoiced in sufferings. <coughs> Hmm? How could he do that? Because grace. You see, if we will come to the point that we allow grace to rule, to reign, have authority, have dominion, overcome everything else, we will be graceful people. Amen. I want to tell you something about grace. That's so wonderful. See if you found the Old Testament. It said it's a glory of a man to overlook an insult. The glory. Listen. Every person living and here today will be insulted. Yes. But it's glory to overlook an insult. Yes. Now you say, well, what if somebody insults me? He said, don't render insult for insult. Yes. Or railing for railing. But contrary to what? Blessing! So we bless those that do what? We pray for those that Hmm. Why, how can you do that? No, pause. How can you do that? Listen, what we need to do is release grace in our lives. <clears throat> release grace today. Let this fullness of grace be yours. I must tell you, there wouldn't be a happier group of people because grace also means having joy. Amen. Do you know what else grace is? It's the desire and the power to do God's will. Yeah. Amen. Not, not just the power, it's the desire to do it. And that's what comes to us through Jesus Christ as He reigns in our life. Church, we got a, we got a great opportunity in a world of hate, animosity, iniquity, self-will, where we find them despitefully saying things about us. Hmm? True? Well, praise the Lord. I say praise the Lord. See, God has intended it. He's kept Satan around. You have to realize this. God could have gotten rid. Of, he could have gotten rid of Satan years ago, couldn't he? He could have wiped him out in a moment. But he's kept him here because he is an object through which he uses to receive glory. Amen. Every triumph that we have over death, over darkness, over disease, over damnation and condemnation is a mark for grace. God's grace. God's grace. Grace that is greater. So here Paul celebrates the things that he's enduring. When he's in prison, he said, Rejoice! Rejoice! Again, I say rejoice. Why in the world would you be rejoicing? Because I'm a prisoner here for Christ's sake. I ask you a question. Did he reign in prison? Yes. He absolutely did. If you read there in Philipp Philipp Philippians, you'll find that he is celebrating that even those in Caesar's household have come to Christ. So why is he there? So they could know him. Why did he get to Rome before he was beheaded? So the whole world would know that the great apostle Paul was decapitated here by Nero. And the whole known world, even those in Nero's household, had received the Savior, Jesus Christ, before he died. I must say to you, Paul says, look at the grace of God, which is given to us so abundantly, to the praise of the glory of His grace. The praise of the glory of His grace. And then when he writes in Timothy chapter 2, he says that 
the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. And notice this, once we receive the grace of God, it becomes our trainer, teaching us a denying ungodliness. That means all of our selfishness, all of the worldliness. Denying ungodliness. We would live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present evil world. Now I ask you a question. If you can live like that in an evil world, wouldn't you say you're reigning? Yes. Wouldn't you say that you're in charge and that you rule? If you can live with that type of victory in the midst of the most crooked, evil, you know you've triumphed. And he tells us that he causes us to always triumph. And the reason, again, is because of grace. Lord, train us. So we're looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. The wonder of God's grace is this. You and I have been so transformed that the old nature is dead. We're a joyful people. We're celebrating life. We're not walking in darkness. We don't know where we're going. We're not stumbling. We know for sure who Jesus is and we live in Him. <coughs> He's life to us. He's our peace. He's our security. You say, well, what else does He do? He removes all fear. You know, not one of us today has to have any fear about leaving here. Matter of fact, the greatest fear should be living here. <laughs> not leaving here. You see, in heaven, it's never going to happen what can happen here. In heaven, there's absolute and total and complete security. I want you to visualize this with me. You probably never saw this. Never read about it. But it's a narrative I'm going to share. An extremely wealthy man found a painting that was not only rare, but absolutely unique. And he said to himself, I got to have it, but I don't want anyone to know I'm the bidder. So in a private bid, he gave one million pounds of gold for that painting. And in that auction house, while it's being auctioned, there were guards, elite, trained, equipped, with all the necessary armament to defend that painting because of its value. When the hammer dropped, those that had been guarding it stepped aside. And that entire room was filled with a militia of military equipped personnel. Outside the building, there were three huge armored vehicles. And each of them were filled with crack shot men with AK-47s. The picture was placed in an impenetrable casing with very soft enclosure so no harm could come to that painting. They ushered it outside and surrounded it as though it was Fort Knox. It was placed in the center of the armored trucks and driven away into a place that no one knew. Matter of fact, people were baffled when they found out the price that was paid. A 
painting. A simple painting. I stand before you today. You weren't bought with gold. You weren't bought with silver. You were purchased with the most valuable asset in heaven or earth. The precious, royal, glorious blood of Jesus Christ based on God's grace. Amen. And if you think that picture was valuable because it was purchased by a million pounds of gold, just how much more valuable do you suppose you are? That's true. And if it was surrounded by security, how much more do you think you're surrounded by security? How many more angels do you think surround you always and at all times because you have been purchased by the grace of God? This marvelous, wonderful, blessed gift of God has come to you. And there is absolutely no value that could ever be placed on your importance. Amen. Nothing. You're above it all. Amen. Glory to God. Look at the things that people do. I was noticing the security around Modi, who is the Prime Minister of India. I mean, they had motorcycles and a motorcade that was endless. And I'm saying, Modi, you really look important. But if you could only see the security that I have around me at all times, everywhere I go, because heaven has sent that security and nothing can harm you, nothing can hurt you. He's given his angels charge over you, lest you dash your foot against the stone. Nobody, no time can do anything against you because you are the purchase of God's grace. Wow. Let's live it. Let's love it. Don't ever think you don't have God's attention at all times. And I conclude by sharing this verse with you. One that you know well. Come bold. Where? What kind of, what kind, what kind of throne is it? Grace. The throne of grace. I, I mean, it was just this week I was almost knocked off my chair in the office. Now, I've only read that a million times in my life. <clears throat> Come boldly to the throne of grace. To find what? What? Mercy. Wait a minute. Wait, wait. See, many times we think we have to go to God for mercy because we're feeling guilty or ashamed, or at fault, or mistakes. Hmm? Now listen to that. No, 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 that's not what the throne of grace does. He says you come boldly, <clears throat> confidently, assuredly to the throne of grace to find mercy. I don't want you to come there. Now, oh God, I need your mercy. I'm so sorry. No! You come boldly. Why? You've been bought. You've been purchased with the precious blood of the Lamb. God's grace. Now you come, wait a minute, boldly for mercy? And guess what else? And grace to help in time of need. Amen. Why? Because you have a great high priest who is ever living. Listen, if He's going to die for you, don't you know He's going to live for you? Amen. And if He gave His best in His death, 
Will he not give his best in his life? And since you're in grace, could anyone lay any charge against God's elect? Can any, if he died for you and justified you, then who can condemn you? You are the freest, richest, most fortunate people ever, ever, ever to live. Amen. When we realize there is nothing that He withholds from you. Nothing. As you walk uprightly. Well, how can I walk uprightly? Because He gave you His righteousness. Well, how did I get it? By grace. Well, what did I have to have to do that? Faith. Well, where did you get faith? He gave it to you. Well, I, I, I needed some love. Well, did He give you love? So he says, well, what do you give back to me? I love him because he loves me. Amen. I believe him because he gave me the ability to believe him. Everything I have in life comes because of God's grace. The Father sent his son Jesus, who was full of grace and truth. The Holy Spirit comes as the spirit of grace. And says, I'm going to carry out God's grace wishes in His behalf for you. Oh, my Lord. Oh, my Lord. Are you getting it? So what's my part? Receive the fullness. Do what? Wait a what, what do I have to try? Nothing! Don't try anything. Stop trying. Just trust Him. Receive what He has for you. And you will be a joy-filled, thankful, celebrating person because all that I've needed his hand has provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Amen. Amen. Every moment you think of him, and think of him often, Peter said, stir up your mind by way of remembrance. Oh, Lord, may we be in your scriptures and constantly reading and having our minds revived of what you promised us. The divine promises of God are ours. Every one of them. So let me ask you a question. Why are you questioning if things are going to work? <coughs> They're all going to work for your good. I, I said, did, did you ever read something like that? That all things are working for your good? To those who are called according to his purpose. Because whom he did foreknow, he did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son. Do you see the course that God has you on? You are going to be, you are going to be, and you are going to reign, and you are going to rule, and you are going to enjoy grace because God's given it to you and he's purchased you for that purpose. And if that wasn't enough, he had you born again by the Holy Spirit the spirit of grace so that you're going to love grace. Amen. 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 Church, let's be a grace-filled church. Thankful, joyful, blessed, redeemed. Amen. And you see, we were redeemed by grace. And you know what that's saying to you? Once you are redeemed at the auction block, you must understand something. Uh, there was no one bidding for me. I was a worthless slave. And it wasn't that he said, I'm going to give all the gold and all the silver for Clyde. No, no. Or for John or for Cindy. Or for Florin or for Donald. I am going to give my life. 
my blood. I'm giving it all for you. And then I'm going to be raised for you. And then I'm going to live for you. And then I'm going to come for you. And then you're going to rule and reign with me for all eternity in your home, which I have built for you. And you are going to know you're going to have a crown, which I'm going to grant to you. And you are heirs of mine and joint heirs because I love you. Amen. Period. So what is there to be concerned about? You know what? It's forever settled. Shouldn't we rejoice? Yes. Amen. Father, I thank you today for the wonders of Jesus Christ. Mm.